Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and a special hello to our friends and colleagues who are joining us from Qatar. I'd like to welcome our participants and our audience to the first episode of our museum series titled The Curation and Influence of Islamic Art in Museums Today. My name is Peggy Lohr. I'm chair of the Qatar America Institute for Culture, or as we fondly call it, CAKE for QAIC. I'm also the former founding director of the National Museum of Qatar in Doha. And as such, my interests go to the heart and soul of Qatar's history and current culture. So I'm very pleased to be able to represent CAKE today as we host this webinar. I'm joining all of you from Northern California. And as I indicated, we have multiple time zones represented by both our presenters and our audience. So a warm thanks to all of you everywhere for being with us. A few words first about CAKE. <clears throat> we are a nonprofit institute based in Washington, DC, engaged in arts and cultural programming that connect the US, Qatar, and the wider Arab and Islamic worlds. In this context, we bring together artists, curators, historians, critics, academics and storytellers, architects, designers, and others offering art exhibitions, educational programming, opportunities for scholarly research, and interactive experiences, all designed to foster cross-cultural partnerships. We do so for a diverse audience, both online and in our newly renovated 19th century building in the heart of Washington, DC, which we hope all of you will be able to visit soon. So we are pleased to bring you this first of several virtual museum series webinars with experts from Qatar and the US coming together to highlight and discuss their important holdings of Islamic art, their approaches to them, and the factors that impact them. Today, we focus on the Islamic art collections from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, Qatar, the Freer Gallery of Art and Arthur M. Sackler Gallery in Washington, DC, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, known by its acronym, LACMA. Our participants with us today and their institutions have an important presence in the canon of Islamic art and its history. Our presenters are curators, scholars, and teachers, and respected custodians of Islamic art and culture. As professionals, they engage in research and writing, scholarship, study, acquisitions, and narrative exhibition planning and design, both for new audiences and those already devoted to the subject of Islamic art. They also work closely with donors and improve to ex and expand their collections. And as they speak of their immediate worlds, you will hear how they fulfill their cultural mission and how they have approached the challenges of a pandemic year during which museums closed and programs and exhibitions had to be reinvented to find their audiences. And I believe you will discover too that our experts both in America and in Qatar share the same passion for the concepts, beauty, history, and meaning of Islamic art, along with the pride they invest in caring for these collections. Islamic art does not belong to one place, but to many places. It is embraced by many cultures, different cultures, both religious and secular. And in ranges, it ranges from across geography, centuries, and genres. The objects you will see today represent a variety of forms from illustrated manuscripts to decorative arts, textiles, objects in a variety of other media, objects that tell stories, and objects that simply represent spectacular design elements. So with that broad overview, allow me to introduce all of our distinguished participants. Their bios can be found on the chat screen or um, on our website at CAKE. Our order today for our speakers is somewhat geographical. It's like a swing. We're starting in New York City. We're moving to Washington, DC, then out to Houston, uh, to Los Angeles, and then over the ocean to our colleagues in Doha, Qatar. I will begin with Dr. Navina. She is the Nasser Sabah al Amr al Sabah curator in charge of the Department of Islamic Art, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Dr. Masume Farhad, Chief Curator and the Ibrahimi Family Curator of Persian, Arab, and Turkish Art, Freer Gallery of Art and the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery, Smithsonian Institution, Washington, DC. Dr. Aime Fromm, Curator of Art of the Islamic Worlds, Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. 
Dr. Linda Komarov, Curator of Islamic Art and Department Head, Art of the Middle East at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And Dr. Julia Gonella, Director of the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, Qatar. You may know it as MIA or MIA. Our first presenter is Dr. Navina of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Dr. Navina, I can't give you the floor, but I can give you the screen. Off you go. Okay, greetings everybody. Greetings from New York City to the world out there, to all of you. And many thanks to Dr. Peggy for a wonderful introduction. It's a pleasure to talk to you today about uh, our institution, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which you see here on the first screen, uh, is a grand building on Fifth Avenue, right in the heart of Manhattan, um, and is uh, an extraordinary institution. Next slide, please in which uh, the Islamic department is one of 17 different curatorial departments. In fact, in this one building, you have more than 2 million works of art uh, under one roof. And these works of art generally uh, take on the, the um, character of an encyclopedic collection in that they are very wide ranging. They're very representative of almost, uh, or they have the ambition to be representative of almost every moment of human history and art history. And so um, within that sphere, the Islamic department too sees itself as somewhat, uh, you know, encyclopedic in, in nature, although we have some way to go with covering underrepresented areas, which I will explain. Um, the current suite of galleries that you see on the screen here, the entrance, uh, the entrance uh, galleries is pictured. Um, they opened in 2011 and they were a re revamp, if you like, of very famous galleries that had earlier opened in 1975, setting for the Western world at least, uh, and maybe all the world, um, Islamic art as a very major part of any museum space uh, and gallery idea. Um, our galleries, uh, display over a thousand works of art at any one time and we're constantly changing the installation so if you come through the year you'll find that it's it's not the same throughout the year every three or four months there's a change of the works on paper and textiles and other other items too uh, next slide please I have here a short film to introduce and walk you through the galleries and something that will give you a sense of our spaces slide, please. So um, I, uh, in the time that I have now, I really just wanted to make two uh, basic points uh, about where we are, where we're going. Um, next slide, please. One of them is the idea of the 
state of incompletion, if you like, of the story of Islamic art as it's told in our galleries. We, our collections, as you will have seen, uh, focus primarily on the Middle East, on North Africa, and, and to some extent, Northern India, and, and to some extent, Southern India, uh, the so-called Central Islamic lands and, and a little sort of offshoots from there. Um, and that is an idea uh, and a sort of cohesive uh, history and historiography that, that, that really has evolved in scholarship. But um, the field is moving and the world is changing. And today the idea of Islamic art uh, is really a global one. It's also a local one. And so when you look at all of the themes from the local to the global, um, you, you have to think in new ways. And so one of the challenges ahead for us is to embrace the arts of Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, Western China, Mexico, and the tri-state area, taking away uh, the idea, the, you know, any limitations of geography and, um, and uh, temporality from the concept of Islamic art and seeing what that looks like if you go truly in those directions. So for example, on the screen now, you're seeing on the left-hand side, um, a, a, a Quran page from the famous Blue Quran, which is attributed to the ninth century uh, North Africa. And on the right-hand side, you see one of our new acquisitions, which is a Quran manuscript from Western Africa um, from the 19th century. And we've actually put them together uh, uh, to talk about uh, the you know the relationship of script, the the the, the nature of, uh, of of how do we approach uh, and use the arts of calligraphy as a kind of one one um, uh, pathway in which to embrace global and local traditions. Next slide, please. Another issue for us is when is, is to address the question of when you go into a global sphere and you're really now quite challenge to think of things through style because the styles are so varied or chronology or geography you're talking about everything really um the the how do you then think about the idea of islamic art and one of the things that's emerging for us is the idea of uh, the fundamental philosophical underpinnings that uh, are shared and are perhaps the most um ephemeral and abstract uh, and yet the most powerful, even when everything else is not apparent, that philosophy is there. Uh, so the idea of the meaning of, of calligraphy uh, is, has emerged. Uh, and so we have a new project, which you see on the right hand side. It's a kind of animated video uh, link. And we've been working with the late great Dr. Abdullah Guchani, who many of you might know on this project, uh, to actually digitally animate uh, sections of calligraphy, making it readable for general audiences and explaining in translation the powerful language and the voice of the objects themselves. Um, and so bringing out that sort of uh, dimension. Next slide, please. Um, so having talked a little bit about the idea of geography and meaning and those narratives, uh, I'd like to now just talk about diversity, cultural exchange and social justice, because these are the kinds of new themes that are sweeping through um, museums everywhere in the United States, at least, and perhaps in other parts of the world too. Next slide, please. Um, and again, here uh, comes a question about um, Islam's own voice versus the voices of people and even scholars and others uh, commenting on it, uh, the interplay between the voices um, and, uh, and, and the interesting uh, idea, I think, that, that Islam is itself a, a pathway of diversity and of interconnection and of cultural intercourse. And you see that, for example, with these, uh, the variety of text and painting uh, images that are put up on the screen, ranging from translations of Greek uh, medicinal texts to uh, possibly what is claimed to be the world's earliest attempt at writing world history, to epic narratives and translation of Hindu uh, and non-Islamic materials. And so Islam as a translator, as an illustrator, as a composer and a mediator ultimately between different traditions in its own voice and diverse voices is something that uh, is, is in our mind at the moment. Next slide, please. Uh, objects in our galleries are often placed to 
enhance these dialogues or to bring them out in some ways. For example, uh, the extraordinary interactions between the arts of Iran, India, and China, which happen in all kinds of ways in all kinds of moments, are often expressed by the objects when they're in proximity. So for example, on the left, you see two jade objects, one from India, Jahangir's inkwell, below that a, um, a chrysanthemum bud bowl, which actually has Chinese uh, calligraphy on it from the Chinese emperor who wrote a poem. Uh, it's actually not a Mughal object, but it's a Chinese, Chinese Central Asian one. On the right-hand side, you see a, a Ming candy and then a copy from Iran. Uh, so in this kind of objects that speak to each other and sort of tell their own stories. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, I'm going to end with, uh, with the idea of human uh, agency and the role of the anonymous artist, the anonymous craftsman. We built a Moroccan court, which was part of our, uh, ex the extended version of our Andalusian space, and, and which you see on the right. Uh, and this was a chance for us, of course, to bring the fact that you have eight centuries of Islam in Spain and in, in this part of Europe, um, uh, right up front and center in our galleries, uh, but also by building the court, we were able to bring in the, li the living tradition um, and celebrate the anonymous craftsmen because, of course, uh, the idea of, of authorship is something that's very much in our minds uh, at the moment with all the issues that I talked about. So thank you so much. Thank you, Navina, for that uh, window into your galleries, um, also for a bit of your philosophy and your future directions. And I think our audience might be interested to know in that short video clip that you played, um, is that the background music by Yo-Yo Ma? Yes, yeah, thank you. It didn't, it, it didn't come on my screen right in the beginning, so I wasn't sure. But yes, that was a wonderful composition by Yo-Yo Ma to, uh, for the COVID age, because we have this short video clip on our Instagram and you can hear the whole composition there too. Well, thank you for that. Now we turn to Masume. Good morning, good evening. Um, I'm delighted to be um, here and, and tell you about the institution that I represent. And um, I wanted to thank Qatar America Institute for inviting me. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, we are now moving from, Washington, so from New York uh, to Washington. And um, I think I'm sort of stating the obvious that whether we're talking about Islamic art or any other artistic tradition, um, these collections do not evolve in isolation, but are very much shaped by the size, location, and goals of the institution that they belong to. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus on that um, in, the, in the time that I have. Um, the Freer and the Sackler represent the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. And um, may I have the next slide, please? And are located on the National Mall. Uh, and for those who have not been um, to Washington, um, this is the mall and the red circle represents um, where we sit. We are one of 19 museums and the zoo and numerous research institutes around the world. And um, the Smithsonian, actually, which, which formed the Smithsonian, and which is the largest museum group in the world. Now, the Frio Sackler is one of the smaller museums, but um, we like to think that we are the jewel in the crown. May I have the next one, please? Uh, the Freer opened in 1923 and was in fact the first art museum of the Smithsonian. It was founded by Charles Lang Freer, who made a fortune in railway cars, um, but also was an autodidact, having left school at the age of 14 to support his family. May I have the next one? Um, Freer actually began collecting American art and in particular, the work of um, James McNeil Whistler, which at the time incorporated many Asian features in his work. And that is how Freya became interested in Asian art. And um, he went to Whistler and asked him how he could find out more about um, Asian art. And Whistler, um, who was quite a character, 
uh, tells Freya, go to Asia. And that is what uh, Freya did. And it was, it was um, sort of unusual for late 19th, early 20th century American collectors to actually go to Asia and spend time in Asia and learn about the art and culture of um, the various reasons. May I have the next slide, please? One of the places that um, uh, Freya kept going back to was Egypt and then Syria. And he happened to be in Syria, in Raqqa, at the time when um, Raqqa was being discovered. And he absolutely fell in love with Raqqa ware and started uh, collecting Raqqa ware. And the reason that um, he really, um, he, he was sort of fascinated by this ware is the way that they related to other ceramics that he already had in the collection. And I'm showing you a, um, a, a tea caddy from, from Japan. And this is exactly what interested uh, Freya in, in Islamic art is, is how Islamic art spoke to the other Asian uh, traditions. And um, this, was, um, this was something that was uh, critical to, the, um, to his philosophy. He was an autodidact and um, Freya strongly believed that anyone could learn to appreciate art as long as they spend time, time looking and focusing on the works of art. So that was the philosophy um, that really drove him. And he felt, uh, again, it should be the philosophy for expanding on the collections um, of the Freer Gallery. May I have the next one? So the Freer continued to collect um, in Islamic art after uh, uh, Charles Lang Freer's death in <clears throat> 1919. But unlike the Metropolitan that um, aims or still aims for a comprehensive collection uh, for the Freer, what was really has has been really important is to acquire selectively, but acquire works that can not only speak to other works in the collection, but also tell important and compelling stories. So the collection at the Freer is by no means comprehensive, by no means, but each object is really intended to represent uh, parts of the um, artistic tradition of the Islamic world, or for that matter, um, other parts of the, um, of the collection. May I have the next one? And we not only collected, uh, we not only collect objects, but also um, manuscripts. And again, um, that's one of the great strengths of the, of the collection because um, these manuscripts not only speak to other traditions, whether it's the West, um, Chinese, and as, as Navina pointed out, earlier Greek tradition, but also um, to the West. So it's the dialogue um, that these objects allow us to have with other Asian traditions that has been very central to the collecting philosophy of the Freer. And may I have the next one? And we have continued again to collect um, selectively. And this is a recent um, acquisition that I wanted to show you. May I have the next slide? So in 1987, the um, Sackler was built as the sister institution to the Freer next door. So now why did we need another museum of Asian art? Well. Um, Mr. Freer was incredibly generous to the Smithsonian uh, with his gift um, of the institution and the collection, but he made one condition. And the one condition was that no objects from the Freer could be loaned to any other institution and no object from another institution could be showed at the Freer. So in the 1970s and 80s, when blockbusters became the norm for museums, even though the Freer had an you know, outstanding collection, we could not really participate um, in loan exhibitions, 
whether it was lending to other institutions or actually borrowing works of art. So what the Sackler allowed us to do was not only to collect, but also participate in the sort of larger um, artistic exchange that became the norm in the 70s and the 80s. May I have the next slide, please? So um, the Sackler opened um, with a, a remarkable collection that we were able to acquire. This is the collection of um, Henri Vever, a French jeweler. With, and the collection was believed to have been destroyed during World War II, um, but the um, Smithsonian was fortunate enough to acquire um, the collection and it built a very strong base for um, the Islamic collections in the Sackler. We have the next one. But what really made the Sackler um, stand out from its sister institution, the Freer, was the loan exhibitions um, that we started having uh, in the 1980s. And I'm showing you here a number of different um, images of, of different um, exhibitions that we've had. We started off with um, uh, Tamor and the Prince vision, which is on the top um, left, uh, then style and status an exhibition of, of kaftans from, um, from Turkey. Um, on the lower right is um, Roads of Arabia, that we, uh, an exhibition that we um, did uh, more recently. And um, the last major exhibition on Islamic art that we had was um, Art of the Quran, again, a major loan show uh, from uh, Turkey. May I have the next one? And um, just as a teaser, I wanted to let you know, we're very much looking forward to collaborating with Mia um, to do an exhibition on um, Safavid textiles uh, in, um, at the end of this year. The next one, please. Another area that the Sackler stands out um, is contemporary art. We are probably um, one of the first institutions in the United States, if not the first, to not only have contemporary exhibitions of um, artists from the Middle East, but we also started acquiring works uh, by them. And here I'm showing you um, a photograph or a pair of photographs um, done by Janan Alani, a British slash um, Iraqi artist. Now, we spend a great deal of time deciding what to, um, what to acquire in terms of Islamic art, because we have, or Asian art in general, because we have the Hirshhorn, which is the Museum of uh, Contemporary Art at the Smithsonian. And we decided that we were going to focus on photography. We have the next one. Um, this is an exhibition that we had in 2016 of the work of Ahmad Mater. Again, several of the works um, we acquired. May I have the last one? And um, here is an exhibition that we um, had just before COVID on uh, female Iranian photographers. Again, many of these works are in our uh, collections. Now, um, all of this was pre-COVID. And I'm happy to speak later on about what we are hoping to do after we reopen. Um, one, certainly one development is shifting uh, much more to the virtual world than we've had in the past and share some of our collections and expertise um, virtually to our national and international audiences. So on that note, thank you very much. Thank you, Masume, um, for that chapter of history into the formation of the collections, most interesting. And of course, any department of Islamic art within a museum, to some extent, has to vie for the resources of that one museum. And when you state that you have 19 museums on the mall or and, and beyond the mall, um, that's quite a challenge. Of course, that involves Congress, and that's a whole other dialogue that one could have. But thank you for that. Um, next up, Aimee from the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Right. Thank you so much for the warm welcome and invitation. I'm absolutely delighted to be here with everyone today. Um, 
magnesium colleagues, the Qatar America Institute and our worldwide audiences. If you're traveling, I warmly invite you to visit us in Houston. We were actually the first major museum to reopen uh, in North America, and we've been open continuously since May 23rd, thanks to enhanced uh, safety protocols. Next slide, please. Great, thank you. In these unprecedented times, uh, my department, Art of the Islamic World, actually has two exhibitions on view in two cities. Next slide. Bestowing Beauty, Masterpieces from Persian Lands in Atlanta at the High Museum. Um, it's on view until April 18th. And next slide. Between Sea and Sky, Blue and White Ceramics from Persia and Beyond here in Houston at the Museum of Fine Arts until May 31st. So due to pandemic scheduling, um, Between Sea and Sky was pushed back and we opened actually on November 1st, the same day as, if you'll show the next slide, our new kinder building for modern and contemporary art. And this kinder building is really a significant addition to our 14 acre campus, adding over 100,000 square feet of exhibition space for our global modern and contemporary art collections. It also caps off our $476 million campus expansion. Um, we also recently added a purpose-built conservation center and expanded our Glissel School uh, for the Art. So just to give you a bit of background, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston was established in 1900, and it's among the 10 largest art museums in the United States, with an encyclopedic collection of more than 65,000 works dating from antiquity to the present. Our main campus includes the Caroline Weiss Law Building and the Audrey Jones Beck Building. They're actually visible in this slide in the lower left corner, their roofs are at least. Um, two house museums. The next slide, please. Bayou Bend Collection and Gardens, and next slide. Rienzi, which present um, American and de uh, European decorative arts respectively. The next slide. Next slide, please. In 2000, oh, back one. <laughs> In 2007, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston made an institutional commitment to collect, exhibit, and interpret art of the Islamic world under former director Peter Marzio. And in, in, there were some significant initial acquisitions made in 2007. Next, please. A 14th century dated Quran manuscript. Next slide. 12th century incense burner. Next slide a 16th century Ottoman Tondino. An inaugural curator, Dr. Francesca Leone, was hired part-time from 2008 to 2011. And our current director, Gary Tintero, created a full-time curatorial position and invited me to join the museum as curator of Islamic Art in 2014. Next slide. So together, we're continuing to expand our collection with an emphasis on quality and rarity through generous gifts. Next slide. Purchases and long-term loans. Next slide. Doc, uh, Director Chintero tasked me with expanding the permanent galleries. I installed the new Art of the Islamic World's galleries in January 2015 doubling the museum's permanent gallery space devoted to Islamic art. So the galleries highlight important themes of Islamic art, such as the art of the word and strengths of the museum's growing collections, which include art of Arab lands, Turkey, Iran, Central Asia, and later South Asia from the ninth century to the present day. So all of these lands, as you know, have vibrant cultures and regional traditions. Um, as you know, the Islamic world is not a monolithic entity, but rather a tapestry of worlds representing a diversity of cultures, ethnicities, confessions, languages, and regional traditions. And I really seek to expand beyond the traditional siloed display of museum permanent collections. So I created a new section which brings together the Islamic art in conversation with other collections from around our museum. So that's why you see, for example, um, a European painting on the far wall in a sight line from our magnificent Quran manuscript. Uh, next, please. The annually rotating section collections and conversation encourages us to see differently and to make global collect connections. The inaugural installation featured Bartolomea Betra's painting depicting lutes and other musical instruments on a table covered with an Anatolian Holbein carpet. The lute, an instrument uh, that predates Islam, 
was introduced to Europe from the Arab Al-Uds played in Spain and Sicily. And together, the Italian painting, the Spanish box, and the Turkish lute reveal our shared musical and artistic heritage. Next slide. We also expanded upon our landmark partnership since 2012 with one of the greatest privately held collections of Islamic art in the world, the Al Sabah Collection, co owned by Sheikh Hassa and Sheikh Nasser Al Sabah of Kuwait. Sheikh Nasser uh, sadly passed away in de December 2020. The next slide. With the Al Sabah curator uh, Sue Kaukji and guest curator Giovanni Curatola, we published a catalog and more than doubled our gallery space and presentation from 60 to over 240 works. The next slide, please. Ranging from carpets and arch architectural fragments to exquisite ceramics, metalwork, jewelry, scientific instruments, and manuscripts. Next, please. The works are arranged chronologically and geographically as well as thematically. They present a more complete story of Islamic art and serve as teaching galleries for Houston schools, including Rice University and the University of Houston. I previously taught semester long courses at Rice and I'm happy to say that they have hired a tenure track professor, Dr. Farshid Imami, and together we will host the next Historians of Islamic Art Academic Symposium um, at both the museum and Rice. Next slide. Oh, here are just some favorite um, works from the Al Sabah exhibition, Treasury of the World. Um, this was shown both at the Met and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston in, in 2002, and they're now on view um, here in Houston. So the two MFAH permanent galleries plus the two Al Sabah galleries comprise the largest display of Islamic art from the Islamic world on view in the southeastern United States in Houston, which is a city of great diversity. Residents here speak over 90 languages. Next slide. We're also very privileged to have an extraordinary comprehensive collection of Persian art on long-term loan to the museum. And one of the significant characteristics of this collection is that it's been personally assembled over the last 50 years by Mr. Hossein Afshar, an astute collector with a keen eye for quality. And the collection really reflects his lifelong passion and dedication to preserving the artistic heritage of Iran for future generations worldwide. So these works span the centuries, all as um, artistic media. Next uh, slide, please. Great. Um, and I'm showing you here uh, Bestowing Beauty, Masterpieces from Persian Lands, a catalog that we published in 2019 for the accompanying exhibition. We selected universal themes that would find resonance with all audiences, faith and piety, art of the word, love and longing, kingship and authority, and earth and nature. So this is the exhibition that's actually now on view in Atlanta. Next slide. Next slide. Great. Currently on view in Houston is Between uh, Sea and Sky, Blue and White Ceramics from Persia and Beyond, which is, focuses on one of the most significant but understudied aspects of the history of blue and white ceramics over the last millennium. The artistic, technical, and economic exchange between Persia and Iran, or, or Iran and China. Next slide. So we do this through the unique lens of Mr. Afshar's Persian blue and white ceramics. Um, so this is a kind of a, a focus collection within the larger collection. So it's wonderful to have the breadth and depth in a single collection, as you see here with the dervish and his blue bowl, and then the, um, the blue bowl. So we bring together on view for the first time all of the museum's most important examples of blue and white ceramics produced around the globe, in addition to just the uh, Persian examples. And my colleagues at the museum really kindly lent their objects and expertise to the exhibition and a publication. Next, please. So this is the September, October 2020 issue of Arts of Asia, which is devoted to all of our blue and white collections. Next. So blue and white English porcelain and Delftware from the museum's Rienzi and Bayou Bend House Museum collections, Japanese Arita Ware from the Sarah Campbell Blaffer Foundation collection, and our important examples of global contemporary blue and white ceramics really attest to the continuation of this uh, enduring fascination. Next, please. 
And I love this image of Miss Ima Hogg, um, Houston arts patron who bequeathed her home and her art collection to the museum. She's shown here uh, with the Monteith bowl in the foreground and a Monteith bowl was used um, to rinse or chill glasses before serving. Next slide, please. So the roots of artistic, technical and economic exchange in our interconnected globe are really multi-directional and they are enriched by many layers of intersection uh, and influence that have benefited all cultures along the way. And this continues to the present day. Next slide. So I really advocate for bridging the siloed approach to museum collections. I think the more we study our global collections together beyond traditional presentations, the more nuanced our understandings will be. And I would just like to close with um, a few suggestions for our discussion. Um, as museum professionals, what lessons have we learned from the de devastating pandemic? How do we wish to shape the future? Um, I've been thinking a lot about material and mobility of ceramics for Between Sea and Sky. And I've also been reflecting on the material and mobility of art during the pandemic. As we know, the greatest mobility of art has been online. We're reaching new audiences. We're able to connect internationally as we are here today across several time zones, um, but the digital experience really can't replace the materiality, the in-depth looking and the discussion in front of a work of art. So I believe our mission really remains the same to drive our audiences into the museum. And as I plan for our new permanent galleries, I'll continue to highlight cross-cultural artistic encounters, exchanges and influences, as well as a sense of the extraordinary dynamism that is characterized um, Islamic civilization since its very beginning. And I'll also be mindful of an enhanced online uh, presence as well. Um, next slide. Our museum really plays an important role in the daily life of Houston. 90% um, of our visitors are local. And so we serve not only as a cultural institution, but really an urban oasis, um, one that's open to all, providing a space um, and our art collections for contemplation, reflection, and inspiration. I know this is something that we will all plan to uh, continue uh, post-pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Aimee. Um, it's so exciting to know that Houston is not only uh, expanding the galleries or have expanded the galleries, but you're expanding the collections and you have multiple exhibitions. Um, so I'm very curious about the demographics in Houston, and I hope when we get to the Q&A, you can talk a little bit about the dynamics of the community. Thank you. Um, on to Linda from LACMA. Um. Well, good afternoon, good evening, and for anyone in LA, uh, good morning, where it's still quite early. Um, thank you so much for the uh, Qatar American Institute for inviting me today. And it's been you know, wonderful so far hearing what my colleagues have to say about their collections and their plans. I'm going to talk a little bit about collection building, something that I've had the opportunity to, to do during my, I hate to say it, 25 years at, at LACMA. Um, in part, not only because I'm proud of the collection as it exists now, but also to inspire those of you out there who are either junior curators or budding curators anywhere in the world that these things are possible. If you have a dream, sometimes the money will follow. And in terms of my dream, I would have to say the dream was inversely proportional to the amount of money that I began with. And it was a very big dream. So here you just see um, a view of LACMA. It's about it's about half of what you could actually see if you came to LACMA campus today. The museum was founded and uh, came to the site in, which is in the mid Wilshire area in 1961, but there's not a, at the moment, not a trace of the 1961 buildings. They've been torn down and we're in the process of building a large building uh, designed by the art architect, Peter Zumthorne. I'll show that at the end of the, uh, my slide presentation. So right now, there is no Islamic art on view at LACMA. Actually, there's one bowl that's in a contemporary art exhibition, but that's about it. The collection's in storage at the moment, and hopefully some of it will be on view in, uh, in a couple of years. Can I have the next slide, please? So when I came to LACMA, um, well, one of the reasons I was inspired to come to LACMA is I knew it had a very good collection of Islamic art. And so that, that sort of drew me westward from, from, from New York. 
because LACMA is relatively young among American art museums, 60 years old, one of the things the founders of the museum and the first directors had to do was to maybe play catch up with other museums because the, 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 the dream for this museum was that it be an encyclopedic art museum. And so one of the ways that the museum was able to create uh, collections fairly early on was to buy entire collections or to receive collections as gifts. So although there were some Islamic works of art and some very important ones in the collection prior to 1973. In 1973, the museum acquired a complete collection of about 750 works of Islamic art from the New York art dealer, Nasli Hiramanik. Um, other gifts and acquisitions added to the collection in 1985, a large gift of uh, primarily Turkish art from Edwin Binney and then um, continued acquisitions. But in 2002, during my time, we had the opportunity to acquire another collection of over 700 works from the private collection of um, Dr. Man Medina. Today, we have about 1,600 works in the collection. And I should just also mention my department, Art of the Middle East, goes from the fourth millennium BC up to the present day. So the total holdings of the department are about 3,500 works. So as I said, what, one of the things that drew me to LACMA was I knew it had a, a very fine collection. It was strongest in Persian art, which is what you, you see here. Um, the two ceramic works, the ceramic mihrab and the samanid bowl in the center, both came from the Hiramanic collection. The other works are, were gifts and purchases. Next slide, please. Um, as part of the strengths of the Persian collection, we're very lucky, lucky to have two great Persian carpets from the 16th century. They actually are our only uh, carpets from Iran, but they're fabulous ones. One on the left-hand side is the mate to the Ardbeel carpet in the V&A, also called the Ardbeel carpet. And on the right-hand side, uh, the so-called coronation carpet, which also had a mate which uh, survives in fragmentary condition in Berlin. The next slide, please. The collection prior to my arrival in LA also had some iconic works of Islamic art outside of Iran. So uh, a Mamluk mosque lamp, uh, blue Quran page, you saw the one in the Met, the Torah of Suleiman the Magnificent from the Bini collection on the bottom and an early Iznik uh, wear. Next slide, please. But one of the things I wanted to do with the collection was to make it a more comprehensive collection and a deeper collection. One of the gaps in the collection, which was quite significant, was art from Arab lands. And it was serendipitous that the Medina collection, which we acquired in 2002, was strongest in this area. So that really, um, really deepened and, and, and expanded our collection. So these are all works from Egypt and Syria. Uh, the gold bracelet was an earlier acquisition that I made. Next slide, please. Through acquisitions, including the Medina collection, we were also able to expand and deepen our holdings in art of the Ottoman Empire, which you can see here. Next slide, please. And although we already had strong holdings in Iranian art, uh, this was something we also were able to, to, to deepen. Uh, with the uh, polychrome wood panel, the Minai ewer, and the mosaic uh, star tile on the far right, all from the Medita collection, the Turkmen prisoner uh, in the center, which is something I acquired separately. And then not from Spain, but not from Iran, but not in our collection, uh, represented in our collection, is the astrolabe you see in the lower uh, right-hand corner, which is from Spain, and which was just one of those um, those moments in life it came in as a gift where um, you're wondering how you got to be so lucky because the owner came in looking to, to find out if we would be able to clean it for her and she left without it, um, but made it a gift to the museum. And this was an important acquisition for us, uh, both in terms of having scientific instruments and also in terms of having more material from, from Spain. Next slide, please. But speaking of Spain and also something that uh, was a, 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 an unusual gift, um, about six years ago, a, an email with an attached image was, was bouncing around to different curators at LACMA, which came from the director of the faculty club, the University of California, uh, Santa Barbara. 
asking with one of these panels, um, asking if anyone knew what this was and if we wanted it. So it eventually came to me and I said, yes. And uh, very soon after drove up to, to Santa Barbara. These panels are, from, are probably from the late 14th to the mid 15th century from most likely from a palace in Toledo. And although they are from a period just after that of Islamic rule, they very much reflect, reflect an Islamic style. So it's not, it turned out not to be, um, it, well, it turned out to be a ceiling, although it's used to decorate the wall, it was used to decorate the world, walls and ceiling in the faculty club, but it was actually two different ceilings that had been put together. And I won't bore you with the very long history of this. Um, the earlier of the, the two ceilings are, are what we're working on now and restoring. So on the right hand side, you see some of the panels as they decorated the faculty club. And on the left hand side, you see one of the panels as it's been restored. May I have the next slide, please? Here again, you can see one of these restored panels. And on the left hand side, you see a projected reconstruction um, that we're working on that's based on the, the panels that we have uh, received, but it's a long-term conservation project. What it does though, is it adds to our collection and gives it an architectural presence. But the next slide, please. But really in terms of architecture and probably the acquisition that I'm, I'm, I'm proudest of is in 2014, we acquired a, an 18th century reception room from Damascus. And um, it's, it was, um, it, it was a long haul, both figuring out how to pay for it and then the, the conservation project. But I think if you look at it, you can see it, it all worked out fine in the end. It's not currently on view, it's currently packed up in, uh, in, in boxes. Next slide, please. Uh, it arrived in over 20 crates. Um, the, the room comes from the, docu the documentation we received showed that the room came from a home in the Albasa quarter of, um, of Damascus. And so um, I'm gonna have to speed up a little bit and not tell that whole long story. It arrived in crates, we put it together eventually. Uh, we can see on the left hand side what the cleaning process revealed, which is that the original surface was a bright pink. Next slide, please. And here's just a, another view of it. Hopefully visitors will be able to see it on at LACMA in, in a couple of years. Next slide, please. Here you see what our Islamic galleries used to look like and the little arrows pointing to a contemporary work from the collection. In 2006, um, I decided that it would be a useful thing to begin collecting contemporary art of the of the Middle East. And I found that when I installed it in works in the midst of the historical collection that a certain age group of visitors tended to gravitate automatically to the contemporary works. I had, I had often assumed that our visitors would come and see historical Islamic art and be so overwhelmed by the beauty of it that they could then transition into the into contemporary times and see the beauty in, in, in culture, Islamic culture today. I think that may have been a bit of, ex, of, a, of a stretch for people to make that hundreds of years leaps, but with the addition of contemporary art, I think that helps to focus our, our visitors um, in a completely different way. Next slide, please. So without funds, but with this expanded portfolio, I began acquiring contemporary Middle East art. Today we have, we're approaching 400 works. I think it's the largest such uh, collection in America. Initially, uh, I wanted to show works on their own as well. And so I took over an elevator lobby, which you see here. Next slide, please. When no one noticed or complained that I'd, I'd, I'd taken over new territory, um, I had the area drywalled, so it'd be a better area for showing uh, art. Next slide, please. Within a few years, our, our historical Islamic art collection was on tour, first to Latin America and then Saudi Arabia. So we were able to completely redo the galleries and we had more than enough works in the collection in 2015 and 16 to have not one, next slide please, but two year long exhibitions from the collection. Next slide please. 
Uh, and so the collection continued to grow. I hadn't noticed this, but our director, pointed, Michael Govan, pointed out to me that I was acquiring a lot of works by female, contemporary female artists. And as those of you who follow such things know that in most museums, between two to 5% of the collection represents the work of women. Uh, in our collection, it's about 51%. And uh, just to orient you, Shireen Nishat, uh, Susan Hafuna, going clockwise, Shadi Gadirian, Shireen Girgis, and Mona Khatoum's iconic video, Measures of Distance. Next slide, please. I decided to keep on doing this, and we're going to do um, an, ex an exhibition uh, in 2023 that will focus on our collection with some loans called Women Defining Women in Contemporary Art of the Middle East. So it's all the work of women artists, and it's also imagery related to women artists. So again, um, starting in the upper right-hand corner, photograph by Manal Villan in the center, work by Huda Lutfi. On the right-hand side, a photograph by Rania Matar, and in the lower left, a photograph by Tamina Monsabi. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna end here, I promise, with a, 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 an image of the new building as it's supposed to look. In terms of building the collection, um, I think that's the, the, its further directions will be written by somebody other than myself. But I am looking forward in 2024 to working with colleagues to install some of our Islamic collection in the new building. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. It's clearly a time of planning and great excitement. Um, it's hard for the collection being in storage for you, uh, but some of the things you, you were showing us were just extraordinary. The, the two Persian carpets, the architectural elements were great. And I think it's very exciting what you're doing in the contemporary field too. So thank you. Um, Julia, over the ocean to you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hi. Um, I start now. Yeah, uh, hello. Hi. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here at the other side of the world. It's the evening already. And I also want to thank everyone for joining and uh, for hosting, you know, for you, for Peggy, for hosting all of this. It's, uh, of course, a great honor. Uh, we jump over from one side to the others. Also, we jump maybe from uh, uh, you know, what we have been seeing as departments to a whole museum uh, that is devoted to the Islamic art. And of course, we jump from an environment, uh, America, uh, that is, uh, had, there were many Muslims live, of course, but, you know, to an environment, we just jump right in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, this is uh, quite an important point. Uh, and uh, I will actually now speak about um, a little bit something else than the others be speaking. I will speak about this museum a little bit, of course, introduce the museum, but um, our main thing is that we are going to change uh, a lot in the museum. In fact, we will be closing down in uh, just right after each in mid-May. Uh, so uh, I will introduce a little bit, also speak a little bit about the collection, but I'd like to speak about the changes and why we do the changes. And um, um, next one, please. So the Museum of Islamic Art basically is um, the first big museum in the Gulf area. It's, it started off a whole series of um, uh, museums. Uh, of course, we have many neighbors now, including the National Museum, of course, Peggy, which is uh, just next door and our big competitor. We also have the fire station, we have Mataf. So there is a whole series of museums here. But when this was opened, uh, it was a big bang. It was. Um, uh, you know, it was a big sensation. Uh, the museum was, as many of you know, um, uh, the work of the architect E.M. Pei, uh, who was not the first choice, but then the second choice, uh, or let's say he was the first choice, but um, it took a little while to convince him to come over to do it because already he was very old. Uh, and um, then he decided that's what he does. And um, he had a couple of stipulations. One was the site and the site of this museum is amazing. It's right in the water. It was built in the water. Uh, it was built between old Doha and new Doha and you see new Doha at the end. So when this museum was built, there was nothing of the old towers at the other side. And, um, and yes, and the third one was uh, the interior design. The next one, please. 
So when this museum was built, the museum, of course, as an architecture, a piece of architecture was at least as important as everything else. I mean, this is continues to be in Doha architectural. Uh, uh, they have very big names. And this museum, you can see, this is uh, was at the time, this was the latest um, piece with a lot of Islamic influence, you know, one of his stipulations was to travel to the Middle East. So you see this black and use of black and white stones, you see these little domes, uh, and you don't see the big cupola, uh, but you can also see in the middle the big um, the, the candelabra, which is obviously taken from Ottoman, um, Ottoman uh, mosques. And next one. Yes, uh, the, the museum then, when, when it was built, uh, the, the third stipulation was that he wanted to work with the French company, interior company, uh, Wilmot, which sort of produced the latest of designs, the most beautiful showcases, the most uh, precious uh, um, interior design with, with the stones and the wood. And as you can see, um, this museum was based on, on masterpieces because the museum not only, you know, it's a high class architecture, of course, it's a high class collection. And I just will mention a few things what is important about this collection. The collection was, is of course much later. It was built much later than the collections in the Middle East, uh, in, in America. So uh, uh, the collections were started in the, the 80s, 90s, and were very much driven by um, the former cultural minister, Sheikh Saud, who was the advisor of his um, highness, uh, Sheikh Hamad bin Thani, uh, today the father, the father of the present emir, who had this huge vision of creating these museums, uh, who had anyway a great vision to in fact change uh, all of Qatar from a completely oil dependent um, uh, country to a country that um, bases itself uh, on knowledge, it expands on knowledge, it teaches its people. Uh, apart from the museums, they also built a lot of new um, uh, universities, bringing knowledge into the country and educating the people. So this is one, it's an enormously important vision behind this museum to have, you know, to educate the people um, and, and to teach them. And this um, uh, collection was part of this. So it was part that they would teach people about the heritage of the Islamic world. And just remember, we are in the middle of the Islamic world. When they created the collection, it was, uh, they collected, I wouldn't say not only the best, but a lot of the best. I mean, you see here some of the best and they were, edu you know, they were displayed as being the best. Uh, it had, um, maybe it was also part of the uh, muse museology at that time. You, you look at an Islamic art piece as if you were looking like at a Rembrandt, for example, you, you stand in front of a piece of, uh, of, of uh, in, in front of a vessel and you say, wow, but actually it, it was an art piece. Uh, if you look at the label, it says, vase or you can look at the labels of the um, uh, pen case and it says pen case and with this uh, you um, enjoy the beauty but you don't learn a lot of the story and this is why when this was inaugurated uh, at the beginning uh, people um, uh, liked it very much and they thought it was great and you know it, extremely beautiful but at the end of the day they didn't really learn uh, uh, so much about the history of Islamic art, about the context of the Islamic art, which is why that in fact, pretty much uh, after the opening, people started to think we should have some changes here. Next one, please. So this is um, why you ask yourself, and you know, I'm, I'm talking now, of course, because this will be our main work, talking about this relaunch, you know, why do you have a uh, relaunch. And one of the things is, of course, uh, we adapt to changes in audience, both in Doha and the world. Uh, Doha has changed so much over the past 12 years. The museum was open in 2008, and it was very empty then. By now, and uh, Peggy unfortunately cut out all my slides in between, but there were all, the, you know, there were all these um, um, how can you see the developments that changed Doha was growing, there were more tourists coming, 
uh, before uh, Corona, we had uh, tourist cruise ships coming every day. Sometimes we would have like 7,000 visitors a day. Then also uh, Qatar was growing in itself. There were many more people coming and many more people would come into the museum. We changed also, of course, uh, the, the, our programming. Uh, so we reached out to more schools, uh, to more uh, people living in Doha. So, so the whole... Um, yeah, everything changed and people wanted to know more, but just look and admire beautiful objects. So yes, we cope with increasing tourist number. We want to also attract more tourists to Qatar because we want to boost Qatar's economy. And then uh, as many of you know, we also want to be ready for the World Cup. That's the big event uh, next year. It's just around the corner and we are very scared of this. 2022, they will all come here. And of course, Mia wants to present visitors not only with beautiful objects of the important Islamic heritage, but they also, we also want to show them yeah, the history behind it, make it, uh, you know, make give more context, give more the history, give more the background. And then what is extremely important, and I, th I think I've seen uh, one of the questions already in the questions and answers is, uh, why don't you do more exhibitions for younger generation? This is extremely important to us uh, here in Qatar. Um, the younger generation, um, uh, uh, there are many more young people, and I think Sheikh Amayasa, she always says it's about, I don't know, 60% of the population are under 25 or something like this. So we have, a, 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 you know, a very different audience to, I'm not so sure about America, but definitely to Europe, where I come from. So um, next slide, please. So here you can see when it's crowded, I think many people who have visited Mia, you know, shortly after the um, opening, they always saw it empty, but now it, well, before, now it's empty again, I have to say, but now it is crowded. We had more than 500,000 visitors per year, which is more um, than any museum in Berlin, except the Pergamon Museum per year. So I, just to give you an example, then we had, a number of big exhibitions on, for example, the Syria exhibition that had also more than 100,000 visitors per year. So, so there is a big change and, um, uh, and people are definitely super interested in coming to the museum. Next one. So what do we have to do? I mean, one thing is um, uh, the museum of the, re the, the relaunch of this uh, Museum of Islamic Art is not only uh, includes a change of the visitor trail, but it includes things like upgrading the entrance and security because at the uh, beginning there were so few visitors uh, that it wasn't so important. So now we install more, um, uh, more secure entrances uh, to, for people to come in so they can be checked actually also in, you know, also in view of the World Cup. We also will change the signage uh, and have new boards, next one. We uh, change the atrium, the commercial facilities. We change things in the atrium so people can sit in. Now I have to say the new, the, these slides, I mean, the, yeah, next one. Uh, we will include a virtual place uh, that includes the story of the making of Mia. So because many people are interested in the history of the museum, next one. Then we introduce, that is extremely important, we introduce a comprehensive visitor tray, so we don't look at single objects only, but we have stories behind them. Next one, and I just give you an overview. Uh, the museum galleries are over two floors, and uh, the first floor will be about topics that are included about the religion and the world, Dunya Wadin, because that's, uh, you know, um, ground idea. So we actually include galleries that are um, uh, that deal with religion, which is new because most Islamic art galleries, in fact, do not touch upon the religion. We really would like to include this and also want to include a full gallery on the Quran. And then, of course, have the story of the, the spread of Islam from the Arab world to the east uh, and then to the west. Next one. And in the third floor, we will have a journey from the Mediterranean to Southeast Asia. So this includes like people get a geographical idea about the, 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 
width of this museum of, uh, of the, the Islamic world, including two specialized um, uh, galleries on manuscripts and arms and armor. Next one. So it is extremely important to talk about topics that are re relevant. So we include one, this is in the religion section about education and how education shaped the Islamic world. This is uh, our from the madrasa. Next one. We also have a Damascus room like uh, LACMA and of course like other museums too. This is so we want to talk about cultural aspects, you know, people living and hospitality, which is extremely important for the Middle East. Next one. Then this is our arms and armor uh, gallery with, uh, with our famous horse in the center. So we would like to speak about, you know, how the evolution of, you know, arms and armor speak about how it evolved, uh, in, you know, introduction of gunpowder and swords, of course. And um, next one, I don't have so much time. So I'm, so we highlight the economic and political perspectives in this, uh, for example, with uh, talking about coins and how they were used and what, what they meant, next one. And then uh, this is not the latest one, but we of course introduce areas that are underrepresented in Islamic art museums. Unfortunately, we have not so much on Africa, but uh, we now have quite a lot about Southeast Asia. So we talk about the trade in Southeast Asia here from the Cerebon wreck. And the next one we introduce a completely, next one please, a completely new, gallery on Islam in Southeast Asia, which is, which is, um, which is a novum, for example, yeah, and that was extremely important for, for us, because in Doha, obviously, uh, uh, there is a large percentage of people living from Indonesia and um, this area. Next one. So what is crucial is that the whole museum becomes more family friendly, and we introduce a totally new family trail. Uh, led by two children from Qatar who will uh, lead you around the museum, introducing like smelling and, and touching and uh, discovering things. Next one. And then we have new media in there. I, I, I'm very short now, Peggy. This is, uh, I think it's, it's finally, I'm finally finished. I think it's All right. we uh, need next one. one Q&A. Uh, so I think this is the last, last one is we show new objects in the storage and um, yeah, because, uh, and then we, I'm finished actually, so sorry. Thank you, Julia. For anyone who has been inside the museum, it's a dream world and it's very nostalgic for me. I've, I've spent many, many hours there, but I did take some of your images away. You're absolutely right. I apologize for that. <laughs> want to tell our audience that you did one of our wonderful uh, series on our express for in our expression series at cake which mm -hmm. is on online on our website and it's a full hour of uh, Julia talking about the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha so please check check into that um, thank you everyone and we are now going to move into some questions so that our audience can participate the first one seems to be a general question for everyone although some of you have addressed it what is your collecting philosophy? In addition to a work's importance, do you focus on stories, beauty, composition, and design, or cost? Who would like to take that first? Masume, would you like to start? Oh, there you are. <clears throat> I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be happy to, okay. um, um, to start. I think in, in, in many ways, um, again, uh, it depends on the, on the institution um, and the Again, with an institution that is, is trying not to be comprehensive, um, we are we tend to be more um, sort of spontaneous. I mean, because the idea is to really tell to tell stories um, and find objects um, that can tell larger stories. So that that is the philosophy for the freer. Um, and for the Sackler, and, and you know, here is an issue that perhaps nobody has, has um, touched upon. The Freer has an endowment. Um, so we can occasionally compete with our colleagues and, and, and throw our hat in the ring and, and, and buy some things. The Sackler doesn't have an endowment. 
So that really curtails how you can grow the collection. Um, but right now for the Sackler, for instance, we focus um, primarily on, uh, in terms of Islamic art, we, we, we focus on contemporary. I'm gonna let my colleagues. Okay. Would um, anyone else like to further comment on your collection's philosophy? Um, I can, now that I'm visible again, even to me, um, I, I, I think in, when I started out, I was, I was just bent on expanding the collection to make it more comprehensive. I was never simply randomly buying things, however, I, but I wanted to add things to the collection that we had nothing like before. Um, and and for, for those of you who don't think about these things, museums typically only show maybe between 5, 10, 15% of their collection, the rest is in, in storage. So you want a deeper collection in part so that you can rotate, so you can show different things in the, and so that you can be inspired to do exhibitions that will be largely drawn from your own collection. And that has been the inspiration for me in recent years because we have absolutely no endowment funds. And one of the, one of the, um, one of the pluses in asking donors for money, and I've gotten very good at that, um, I can ask, would anyone like to send us some money? I, I don't mind. Um, is if you say it's going to be included in a, in a major exhibition that's coming up. So that has been the focus. So right now I'm acquiring mostly in contemporary works that will go into this upcoming exhibition on women artists. Thank you. Uh, this next question uh, goes to Navina. Does the fact that Islamic art doesn't really have a specific place and time make it easier or more difficult to determine the installation for it and to communicate messages and value to your various audiences? Well, I mean, it's a special challenge because this field stands apart from other fields in so many ways. It's not, um, it, it, and yet it relates to them. So for example, Islam in one sense is an empire-based category like Greek and Roman or Egyptian. Um, there is a sense of an Islamic empire which has different centers uh, at different moments. But, um, but unlike Greek and Roman and Egyptian, you don't get a sense of where that empire is. It's just a kind of amorphous thing called Islamic. So you have this geographical challenge in as much as you have the, when you have a political kind of, then you have an idea about geography. You know, I won't spell out all the challenges, but um, essentially I think, um, you know, Islamic art historians have tried to define this field in different ways. Is it to do with religion? Is it to do with culture? Is it to do with a political category? Is it to do with aesthetics? Is it to do with identity? Is it, you know, it go, and you know, there are many dimensions to this. And that's the fascinating thing for me. Um, this, I started, I mean, you know, personally as a sort of came into the field from an outsider's position and I was very skeptical in the beginning about, you know, how to engage and understand the parameters, but then over time and having read what everybody said, I, I think there's a certain majesty to it really because of the amorphous qualities of the questions and the fact that you basically have to ride two horses the whole time. You have to be thinking on the Islamic track and you also have to be thinking about regional continuities and about the truth of, of certain individual traditions and locations. So that, that sort of duality or multiplicity is built into the idea of Islamic art. And so I'm sorry if I've deviated from the question was about the challenges. So yes, you can go in many directions or you can uh, you know, define things in a very special individual way. They're both rules and there are no rules. And I think that's, that's what's interesting and exciting about Islamic art. Thank you, Naveena. Um, here's a question uh, from the audience, which uh, really has to do with uh, audience and community, I think, and uh, education. How do you think about your museums as interfaces of research and public education and information, which also means how do you mediate the often complex shifts in current research in your displays? And Aimee, I think you might be good at answering that because you work with the university and I'm sure you work with your own education department in the museum. Sure, that, that's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I've worked very closely with our learning and interpretation department, our community partners, which include University of Houston, Rice University, um, Houston Community College, and then all the yellow school buses that usually come to our museum, but which are not coming this year. 
Um, so we work very closely hand in hand, and that also goes into how we build the collection. As I mentioned earlier, we don't you know, aspire to be a, an encyclopedic collection. We do have the Al Saba long-term loan collection. We've got the depth and breadth within art of Persian lands from the offshore collection. And I'm in close contact with my um, academic colleagues and I've also taught as well, how can we bring out these stories? How can we make the works of art really speak? Um, and I would just continue to emphasize, I know I mentioned um, going away from the siloed approach that I think it's really going beyond boundaries, beyond borders. And that's also a way to bring in new audiences and get um, uh, students of all ages inspired to put unusual combinations together, as I showed with the, um, the two dragon dishes, the Ralph Becerra mid 20th century American one um, that looks to, but it actually looks to Chinese and Japanese woodblock prints um, in the border of it and the 17th century Persian example. And I think, that gets us um, thinking a lot. I hope I answered part of that question. No, oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, another incoming audience uh, question, which is very interesting. Um, and I think Navina, you touched on this and others may have some comments as well. Uh, this person says, I'm curious to know how as curators, you feel you have an ethical and or social responsibility when displaying the art you source, similar to another question regarding provenance, research, and due diligence with consideration to the illicit artifact trade. Who would like to tackle that one? Um, I, I, can, I can start. Um, I mean, I think as curators, we all, um, feel the respons this responsibility and no object is acquired without making sure its background and provenance. And, and provenance studies has become extremely important for um, actually at the Freer Sackler, we have someone who just does provenance research on our collections. So um, it is a growing field, but um, I think it's part of any acquisition um, for all of us to make sure that the object we are acquiring um, has, has no um, issues or, or problems. I don't know how if anybody else wants to um, respond. Well, I could respond to the other part in, in terms of what is our responsibility to the communities, to the people whose art or whose ancestors are represented in, in the art. And I think we all, I could say, feel very strongly about that. Um, and in and thinking carefully about how, how something should be shown, what should we say about it? Um, Julia mentioned that, that most galleries of Islamic art don't discuss religion. I think that's not entirely true in the United States, but I think it's something that we're very careful okay. about um, because we are in a, a pluralistic society with, with multiple religions. But I think, um, and I'm speaking for myself, but I think it's true, say, of Masame and, and others, that we feel very strongly about how Islam is represented in the United States and um, in, in helping Americans to, we, we can't change people's minds necessarily, but we can help to open minds we can't necessarily fill the vacuum in people's heads. We're not educational institutions, but we can inspire people to learn, to read, to take a university course, and when possible, again, to travel. And I think that's of utmost importance. If I could just tell a very quick anecdote, after 9-11, I had a letter from um, a self-identified visitor to our galleries from Minneapolis, self-identified as a Muslim, and she took issue with the introductory panel that I had at the beginning of the galleries, which was very standard for the time, which talked about how Islam expanded, um, but it had nothing to do with art. It was just about the expansion of Islam, obviously, through, um, through armies. And she said to me, um, given the current times, is it possible to discuss, not to discuss Islam as something that's warlike? And I wrote back to her and I said, because you know, I was just following what I'd, what I'd seen. I said, you're absolutely right. It was the silk screen. I said, as soon as we can change the silk screen, I will. And I did. And I realized that, that there was never any reason to discuss it, the expansion of Islam through armies when you're doing an introductory panel on Islamic art. And instead I changed it to something that actually discussed the art. 
Great example. Boundaries. Great example. Thank you both for that thoughtful response to that to that issue. We we have time for one last question, and I think most of you might be able to respond if you do it quickly, because we are really at the end of our of our day. Um, the the question is this: What aspect of your work with the collections excites you the most? Is it the care, the research, the intellectual aspects, new acquisitions, perhaps the design and stories for the galleries? Julia, would you like to start? Well, uh, I think the, the part which I like best is working with people, to be honest, more than with the art, which sounds a bit strange as a curator. Maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but uh, I think it's the exchange, uh, engaging with people, uh, discussing with people, meeting with people, working with people uh, is just uh, the most exhilarating. And then you exchange, um, yeah, ideas and everything and you have conversations. I think that's great. Thank you. Masume? Um, it's hard to choose from, from, um, from what you listed. I, I, think, um, I think for me is I feel I, I'm learning something every single day and that's what excites me the most. I mean, whether there are discoveries in the, in the collection, it's, it, it, it may sound a little Pollyannish, but I think that is why I love what I do despite you know, all the ups and downs and challenges, the fact that, you know, I see something new in an object, I have a new idea, I suddenly see a connection. It's that excitement, it's the spark. And that's what I hope that all of, you know, if there are any aspiring curators in the, in the audience, um, it is a wonderful field to come to. There is so much to discover. There is so much there. So I encourage all of you to look for that spark in Islamic art. Thank you. So curiosity is important as well. <laughs> Amy. I, I would have to agree absolutely with uh, Masame. It is that spark, it's learning something new and it's really um, unexpected new partnerships with people. I'll just cite one example. I was trying to identify a bird um, in a Mughal miniature and I knew it could be identified because it was so precisely detailed and it was actually my volunteer who said why don't you reach out to the Houston Zoo and I found out we have the fourth largest collection of birds in North America and I made a new friend Chris Holmes who identified this Chinese golden pheasant in a Mughal miniature painting and he said those aren't indigenous to India they weren't at, at that time in the 17th century either and he said it's probably a diplomatic gift and I said I think you're probably right so it's exciting. It, it really is that spark, new discoveries every day. Well, thank you. Um, will you forgive me, Navina and Linda, because we are at the end of our moment and we really do have to close. Uh, we've, we've covered a complex range of issues, but, but barely at the same time. Um, but allow me to thank each of you, our knowledgeable presenters, for being with us today and giving us a lovely portal into not only the beauty and significance of Islamic art, but also into your continuing work in advancing and studying and caring for these collections. Additional thanks go to our programs team at CAKE, Sarah Alamadi and Lindsay Medlin, as well as our communications department for their technical assistance. And a very special thanks to you, our audience, for joining us for your interest in this subject and for your good questions. And I'd like to remind everyone to please stay tuned for announcements from CAKE and to follow us on our at Cutter America platforms where you will be able to find a recording of today's webinar. I also invite you to describe, subscribe on cutteramerica.org and to stay informed of our future activities and our resources. So goodbye for now, everyone. And again, many, many thanks for being with us today.